This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello, my name is Gordon Smith. I'm a neuromuscular neurologist and chair of the Department of Neurology at Virginia Commonwealth University. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Haya Bashara, who's a neurologist at the Lady Davis Carmel Medical Center in Haifa, Israel. Haya is the lead author on a paper in the Green Journal about the association between Guillain-Barre syndrome and COVID-19 infection, as well as COVID-19 vaccination. This was a population-based nested case control study. Hiya, thanks so much for joining me on the Neurology Podcast. This is obviously a timely and very important topic for our listeners. Thank you for having me. Maybe before we talk about details of the methodology and the specific finding, what's the take-home point if our listener has to run? What do you want them to know about the study when they go to clinic tomorrow? So two things. Most importantly, about vaccines and just to encourage our patients to receive vaccine, especially the Pfizer vaccine, against COVID-19. I think we just live today in an era where there's a movement against vaccinations and we should remember how many great things vaccines have done to humankind and just to encourage our patients about the safety and efficacy of vaccines like this article has shown. And the second thing is just when a patient would come to you with a clinical presentation that would make you even remotely suspicious of Guillain-Barre, just to always have that in the back of your mind. And if they tell you that they had a COVID infection just prior to that, just do additional tests or observe this patient more and do anything you can to rule out that uh, diagnosis or prove it. I think that's really great. And we've had similar sort of conversations regarding influenza vaccine relative to the risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome following influenza virus. So this is sort of a similar story. I wonder if we could begin by just talking a little bit about the study methodology. How did you go about sorting out whether there was a relationship between the vaccination and Guillain-Barre syndrome or COVID infection and GDS? As you said, I work in Cameron Medical Center, which is affiliated with a healthcare provider called Clarit. In Israel, it's mandatory for everybody to have a healthcare provider, and Clarit is the largest one in Israel, and it's the second largest in the world, by the way. So we use the database from that healthcare provider and the database from the Ministry of Health of Israel that would record and document everything that has to do with COVID or with the vaccination at the time. And what we did was we used these documentations to detect Yanbury cases. And then we went on to see if they had an infection before that or if they had the vaccine before that. And we would just compare these cases to control cases. And from that, we had our conclusions. What were the results? What's the answer? Patients with COVID were six times more likely to have Guillain-Barre further on. And on the other hand, we found that patients who were vaccinated had the risk of developing Guillain-Barre cut by more than half which I think is very encouraging results. That's really remarkable. So a 50% risk reduction in Guillain-Barre syndrome. So I I wonder if we could shift a little bit and talk about another study that was recently published regarding a study in the UK looking at the UK National Immunoglobulin Database. And this study is another big data study Mm -hmm. in a country that actually monitors data much like Israel does, which is, I think, a real advantage. But what they found was a drop in Guillain-Barre syndrome incidents during the pandemic. So as a country, they saw less GBS. But what was interesting is there wasn't a relationship between geographic location of GBS and geographic hotspots for COVID-19 and and suggesting that there might not be a relationship. I wonder if you could just compare and contrast. How do we interpret these studies relative to each other? Yeah, definitely. And this is a great study, and it was actually cited in our paper First of all, it's it's not uncommon for all sorts of studies to have contradicting results. This is why we even started our article in the first place, because we saw that there was a lot of fog, let's call it, in the literature and a lot of contradicting results. However, the methods used in our study and in that study are very, very different. What they saw was um, they really compared the prevalence of Guillain-Barre during the years of the pandemic as opposed to uh, years before. And what we checked was whether there was an association. We had a very specific question, whether there was an association between 
COVID-19 and GBS or the vaccine and GBS. And we're not saying whether there is a decline in GBS prevalence or whether the rates were reduced or whether that didn't change. Uh, we didn't check that. I would like to say that a similar study was done in Italy, and we also cited that in our article that did find an increase in GBS rates during the pandemic time. Having said that, one thing um, that we might take into consideration when we check the prevalence of GBS and compare, the, uh, compare it between these two timeframes is that during the pandemic, as we stated also before, people were really much more attentive of personal hygiene and social distancing. And it is possible that there were fewer influenza rates, for example, and thus this would affect the prevalence of GBS during that time and affect the study results. The same study also uh, checked whether there was an association between AstraZeneca, between the vaccine and the GBS. And here you can't really compare the two studies because we mainly uh, focused on Pfizer and we mainly focused on AstraZeneca. So that's really apples and oranges. You can't really compare the two. We're very confident in our study and in our results. That's a great answer. And I, I'd love to talk a little bit just about influenza and, and the comparison with COVID-19. I, I think I mentioned this earlier. We have pretty similar data, I think, also from the UK regarding the relative risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome and infection with influenza versus an influenza vaccine. And it's very clear you're much more likely to get Guillain-Barre syndrome from an infection than you would from vaccine. Your data, if I recall, the influenza data seems to suggest a, a even stronger protective effect for COVID-19 infection with the vaccine. So we're not worried about the vaccination risk, but how do you compare the balance between infection risk and vaccination risk between influenza and COVID-19? Definitely, it's very similar. The risk of contracting or having Guillain-Barre following an infection, let it be COVID-19 or influenza, is much higher than the risk of having it after a vaccination, just stressing even further, you know, the advantages outweigh the disadvantages when we're talking about vaccinations and the multiple benefits that vaccinations have. Well, hi, I think that's a great way to end our discussion. I think it's really encouraging information regarding the importance, the safety, and the impact, the really dramatic impact of vaccination on health and reducing risk of Guillain-Barre syndrome. And it looks a lot like what we see in other vaccinations. So I guess your article is just adding to the evidence that vaccines are, are safe and effective. And uh, this is really valuable information for our listeners in their day-to-day -day practice. So thank you very much for sharing your study and also your guidance in how we can apply this in clinical practice. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please take a few moments to subscribe, rate, and review the Neurology Podcast through Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. And remember, you can always head to neurology.org backslash podcast for our full list of past episodes, or you can also search by keyword in your podcast app for any neurology-specific topics you want to learn about.